Don? Good. Watch, watch out for that wild animal. Okay. So, just to uh, start for a few minutes, uh, <clears throat> a really fine book that will get you into understanding the whole Renaissance and the role of philosophy in the Renaissance is this book. Huh? And if you can get it, really, it's, uh, it brings all the major thinkers that we think of as thinkers various kinds of Platonic thinkers. They all came out of the work that we're looking at tonight. And that's what started this whole game. It was the first, the first Greek text that was translated by Pacino is the one you have in front of you at the time. Hey, it woke up everybody. Right? And then came Plato, and then came on, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So, a beautiful book that expresses the importance of being Pymandra, or Poimandra, or the shepherd. It's got many, many fine pages. And, uh, Okay, just a, a quote. Pacino who wrote in the Theologica Philosophica actually allowed himself to wonder whether or not, after all, Hermes Trismegistus was Moses. That was the traditional belief. Mm -hmm. Right? And therefore, this hermetic tradition prophesized Christianity since they dated these works to be coincidental with the development of early Judaism from Otis on. So, uh, hey, it's a very fine piece of work, so I'll leave it here. And he's got, by the way, very fine insights into Pseudo Dionysius and all the other things we've been involved in. So. Okay. You go back to it. Okay. Let's get started. Here we go. I propose something new this evening, all right? Um, first, I need.
two volunteers. Would you agree that we can vote on them? So um, let's vote whether or not Josh is a good volunteer. Yes, he is. All right. All right. And would you agree? Um, and Mark, he's a good volunteer, isn't he? Oh, yes. This is what I propose. We're now into the great work called Tresmagidus's by Mandry, the third book. It's a dialogue. Let's get our two volunteers to get up and read it aloud, all right, as a play. Okay. Okay, Josh? Sure. And as much? Yeah. And let, let's keep our old rules. Anytime you want to raise your hand to block the show, to talk, do so. We'll stop at that point and talk about it and then proceed. Fair enough? Yes. Got their two chairs? There they are. Oh, we don't those two are enough? Oh. Yeah. There you are. Uh, Alright, do you have a text? I'm finding it right now. Now there should be in order for this to be real, there should be a commercial first, right? No. No. TV has enough commercial. So here's the work that was attributed to Moses way back in the 15th century. It was thought that way for several hundred years after that, after it was translated. And then there was a mix-up, and they decided to fix the date on the work, and it turned out it wasn't contemporaneous with Moses at all, but in the first century A.D. So here's the question, right? Can you imagine yourself, you're now in the Middle Ages, you're coming out of the Middle Ages, this is the first work of philosophy from the Greek world. This is what Puccino translated first before he did any of Plato's dialogues or anything else he did. This woke up Europe, at least for a couple hundred years before the Counter-Reformation came and knocked it out. So let's take a look, okay? Gentlemen. Does anybody have an extra copy that Josh can read from? I've got this. Yes, yeah. Could you do that? Yeah. Josh? What? Is that better? Oh, here we go, here we go. Oh, that's thoughtful. Thank you, Josh. And as far as staging is concerned, Josh, why don't you come over here? And I'm going to move this for Pierre. Yeah, and we'll, we can just adjust this very easily. Oh, is it a dialogue? I don't know. Maybe it doesn't get to be a dialogue until four. You see the book four? Okay, Hermes? Yeah. Who's the other character? Well, there is. The, there's the D part, or Nether, and the Oh, I've got the Holy Logo. Number three. Oh, three. There's different trees. Wait a second. I don't see. This isn't a dialogue. It doesn't look like Oh, oh, a tat, tat. Oh, yes, it's a dialogue. Is it okay. called that the God is the first of all? And that yeah. the all is divine? You mean book three? Yeah. The God is the source of the real beings. That's book, yeah, you're on. Okay. 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 Loud, clear. Let's see, who's going to read near you? Well, boy, who's the other character? Just is this Hermes right here? Is Hermes speaking? Because we don't have... No, Tan. And then, oh, this uh, is Tan. Yes, you see. Um, oh my God! Let me just see. Tat, tat appears in book four. Yes, yeah, in book two as well. Yeah, but um, okay. Instead of a dialogue, we'll have a mono dialogue. Did you do it? Oh, I'll give it to this okay. man right here. He's a performer. All right. Okay. Seeing that the Demiurgos had made the whole cosmos, 
not with hands, but by the logos, so that in this way it must be understood. We're reading three or four? Yeah, three. Four. Oh, okay. and three. You're, you're doing it all. Let me try it again. There's a tat in book four. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to start over. Okay. <laughs> One A. One A, all right. The God is the source of the real beings and of intellect and of nature and of matter. In order, in order to show forth wisdom by creating everything, by being the source of all. And nature is the energy of the God. And, and nature energizes in accordance to necessity. And she energizes through consuming and renewing. For there was darkness in the unlimited deep and unlimited water. And there was a subtle, intelligent breath which permeated those in chaos with divine power. Thus upon all the indistinct and thoroughly unprepared beings, surely then there was shed a holy light, and the elements and all the gods came to be. All of nature was thoroughly divided in the sowing, for the holes were defined, so that those that are subtle were set apart on high. Thus... The fire was suspended on high to ride upon the wind, air, breath, and those that are heavy sank down, and the sand was laid beneath the fluid usia, and the dry land was made solid by being separated from the fluid usia. And the fiery usia was differentiated along with the gods in self, and the heaven were seen within seven spheres, and the gods were seen in their astral ideal forms, along with all the constellation signs of themselves, and the heaven revolved by running its ethereal circling course, by riding upon the divine breath. Thus each god, by their own power, put forth that which was appointed to self, and there came forth four-footed and reptilian and water-born and winged wild animals and every seed and pasturage and every flower and herb was sown according to their different natures by being seeded within themselves of the seed of regeneration and the generation of human beings by the intuitive knowledge into divine works and by witnessing the energies of nature and the multitude of human works and the rulership of all those under heaven, and all the good insights found in that which is to be increased in the increase, and is to be multiplied in multitude. And that through the encircling course of the gods, every soul that is in the flesh has been prepared for the contemplation of heaven, and the course of all the heavenly gods, and for the intuitive knowledge into the divine power of divine works, and by witnessing the energies of nature, and by going into the signs of goods, by the intuitive knowledge of divine powers, by knowing the unruly fate of good things and bad things, and by discovering all the marvelous works of the good. And it belongs to cells to live and to pass away according to the determined fate of the encircling course of the gods and to be dissolved into time. And there will be some, on the one hand, whose names will live on by leaving behind upon the earth mighty memorials of their artistry, whereas on the other hand, time will hide in darkness the names of the many, and every generation of ensouled flesh, and every skillful work of fruit from seed will be received by destruction. But those that become less will be renewed by necessity and by renewal of the gods and by the encircling numbered course of nature. For all the cosmic blending are the judgments of the divine by being perpetually renewed by nature. For nature has also been established in the divine. Good. Good. Now we can do the second, which is the dialogue. Okay? Is that the no, that was for me, so you're going to be... 
Okay, here we go. Uh, which one are you doing? Two. Book two. Book two, oh, just a second. I'm a sleepy on. Huh? I'm a sleepy on. Oh. A sleepy on. Which guy? Oh, book two. We're on book two. I only uh, have book three and book four. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, hmm. I don't know. I messed something up. <laughs> You're okay? Yeah. Thank you, John. The Logos of Thrice Great Hermes to Asclepion. Is it not the case of all that is being moved, O oh, Asclepion, that it is being moved in something and by something? It is very much the case. Then is it not necessarily the case that in which it is being moved must be greater than that which is being moved? Necessarily. Okay. Accordingly then, must not that which moves be stronger than that which is being moved? It is stronger. Therefore, that in which it is being moved must necessarily contain the opposite nature of that which is being moved. Quite so. Therefore, this cosmos is great, than which there is no body greater. It is agreed. And it is massive. For it is filled with many other great bodies, or rather, with all such bodies that exist. It has to be in this way. But the cosmos is a body? A body? And it is being moved? Quite so. Therefore, of what magnitude must be the place in which the cosmos is being moved? And of what nature? Must not that space be far greater in order that it may be able to receive its continuous motion and that which is being moved may not be cramped by its narrowness so as to obstruct its motion? What a very great space, O oh, thrice great one. Then of what nature is it, O oh, Asclepius? Must it not be of that nature that is opposite to that of the cosmos? For the incorporeal is the opposite to the corporeal. It is agreed. Therefore, that place is incorporeal. But that which is incorporeal is either divine or the God. But now I mean that the divine is not the begotten, but the unbegotten. Therefore, on the one hand, if the divine is either of the nature of the eternal essence, or Usia, or on the other hand, if it is the God, then it must also be distinct from the Usia. But place is especially intelligible, for the God is primarily intelligible to himself, whereas place is intelligible to us, not to himself. For the intelligible is intelligible to that which intellects, Therefore, it is not the case that sense perception pertains to the God. So that place is not intelligible to himself, for that which is being intellected is not something else than himself. But it is intellected by us. Because of this, something else is intellected by us. Then if place is intelligible, but not as the God, but as place, like an encompassing energy, then place is something else than the God. Thus all, everything that is being moved is moved, not in that which moves, but in that which stands fast. Thus, that which moves also stands fast, for it is impossible for self to be moved together with that. 
Therefore, O oh thrice great one, how is it that those stars that move in this place move together with those planets which they move? For you have said that the wandering spheres are moved by the unwandering sphere of the stars. This motion, O Asclepion, is not motion in the same direction, since it is motion in the opposite direction. For they do not move in a similar way, but in a way that is contrary to one another. Therefore, the opposition of their motion maintains stationary the gravitational resistance of their motion, for their motion is kept stable by their resistance. Therefore, the wandering spheres are being moved in the opposite direction to the unwandering sphere of the stars <clears throat> by each other being moved by the opposition of the counter movement about the stationary self. And it is impossible to be maintained otherwise for these bears, the big and the little dipper, which you see neither rise nor set but turn about the self. Do you think that they are moved or that they stand fast? That they are moved, O thrice great one. Well, what kind is their motion, O Asclepion? It is the motion that turns about the self. Therefore, the revolution about the self is the motion that is held fast by stability. For that motion about the self prevents it from going beyond the self. Thus, by preventing the motion from going beyond the self, results in that motion about the self, if it is to be stable. And in this way, the motions that are contrary are steadfast and stable by being kept stationary by their contrariety. Now I will point out to thee a model, if you're following me, which you can see with thine own eyes. I mean, for example, those living beings upon the earth, such as by contemplating a human being swimming, for the water keeps flowing, but the resistance of the hands and the feet upon the water brings about stability for the human being, so that the swimmer is not carried away by the water. That model is clear. Oh, thrice great one. Therefore, all motion moves in a stable place. And by the power of a, of a stable, <clears throat> an intelligible and incorporeal place. Therefore, the motion of the cosmos and of all living matter does not happen to arise from those that are outside of the body, but from those that are within, to that which is outside, either from soul or from something else that is incorporeal. For a body that is ensouled is not moved by a body since it is generally the case that body cannot move body, even if the body is soulless. How do you mean this, O oh, thrice great one? Therefore, when logs and stones and all other soulless things are moved, are they not moved by bodies? In no way at all, Asclepion. For that which is within the body, that which moves that which is soulless, is not a body. That is that which moves both, and that is that which moves both the body of the carrier and that which moves that which is being carried. For which reason that which is soulless cannot move anything self by self. Surely then you see the soul being weighed down when she carries two bodies alone. So that it is clear that those that are moved are both moved in something and by something. <clears throat> then, O oh thrice great one, must those that are moved be moved in a void? Hush, you must speak well, Asclepion. Not one of the real beings is void, since it is only that which is not real being that is void. For the hyparxis can never come to be void through the logos of the hyparxis. Therefore, that which is being could not be that which is being. Excuse me, let's try that again. Therefore, that which is the being could not be that which is just being if it were not filled full of the hyparxis. Therefore, are not such things void 
O thrice great one, such as an empty jar or a pot or a trough and all the other likes? Oh, the magnitude of your wandering, Asclepion. Are you led to believe that these are empty or void, but rather the real beings are the fullest and the greatest? What do you mean, O oh, thrice great one? Is not the air a body? A body. But does not this body permeate throughout all of the real beings and fills all by its permeation? But is not a body composed by having been blended out of the four elemental bodies? Therefore, all those which thou says are empty are full of the air. And if of the air, then they are also full of the four elemental bodies. And so, the opposite logos has been brought to light as a result, that all these vessels which you say are full are in fact empty of the air by those elemental bodies being compressed by other bodies. And so they have no space to admit, receive, or take in the air. Therefore, these vessels which, that, which you say are empty should be called hollow, not empty. For they are full of the hypoxis of air and breath of life. The, the Logos is unopposable, O oh, thrice great one. Stay there. Therefore, what did we say of the space in which the all is moved? For we said, Asclepios, that it is incorporeal. Therefore, what is this that is incorporeal? Well, it's intellect encompassing itself, whole from whole, being free from corporeal wandering, imperturbable, intangible, stably fixed self in itself, containing and preserving of, of all the real beings, the light of the soul. Therefore, what do you say is the good? The good is the archetypal light of which the intellect and the truth are just as if they were rays. Therefore, what is the God? God is neither of these hyparxes. Whereas by being the cause to these, by being the cause to these, and of the existence of these, and to each one and to all of all the real beings, for there's not anyone left out except that which is not, therefore all those that come to be exist out of the real beings not out of those that are not real beings. For the sterile nature of those that are not real beings does not possess the power to come to be something. Since their sterile nature is such that they cannot come to be anything. And in turn, the eternal nature of the real beings does not possess that which does not in any way exist or that which does not ever exist. Therefore, the God is not intellect, but the cause of the existence of intellect. Nor is he the breath of life, but the cause of the existence of the breath of life. Nor is he the light, but the cause of the existence of the light. For which reason the God must be worshipped by these two familiar names, by them belonging far and away to self alone and to no other. For none of the other beings called gods nor human beings, nor spirits, can even be good to any degree as the good. For the God alone is good, and this alone is good, and no other, since all the others are incapable of containing the nature of the good. For body and soul are not capable of containing the good place. For such is the greatness of the good. Such is the hypoxis of all the real beings of both the corporeal and of the incorporeal, of the sensible and intelligible. And the God is solely this and no other. Therefore, call nothing else good other than solely the God, since you would be impious. And never call the God anything else than solely the good, since again, you would be impious. Therefore, on the one hand, the good is spoken by all in word, whereas on the other hand, what in the world it is, is not intellected by all. And so because of this, the God is not intellected by all. 
And so, in their ignorance, they call the gods and certain human beings good, who cannot ever be, nor can ever come to be good. For the good is the most alien, foreign, and strange thing to these. And the good is inseparable from the God by being the God and divine self. Therefore, on the one hand, all the other deathless gods that are called good are honored by the name of the God. Whereas on the other hand, the God is called the good, not by way of honor, but according to nature. For the nature of the God is one with the nature of the good. And so there is one genus from both from which there exists all the genera. For the God is good, since all is given and nothing is taken. Therefore, the God gives all, and nothing is taken. Therefore, the God is the good, and the good is the God. Okay. Let's hold it there. Now, do you think this is a good time to... um, Congratulate the Bob Owens on translating this. Thank you. What are you saying? What? Are we? This hit Europe. What are you saying? Well, it was like uh, whoever wrote this had Empedocles, Parmenides, Timaeus, all before him That's right. when he wrote this. Right. Yeah. How about the role of the self? Yeah. Major? Yeah. And the good? And being? And being? It's all there. Yeah. And the one? Yeah. And a very fine, well written, yeah. well translated. Yeah. Right? But like you, Mark said, it seems like it's very descriptive and it does describe certain relationships, but you only need the rest of the Platonic tradition to understand it. <laughs> That's right. Really? This is the introduction of uh, this kind of understanding in Europe. Yeah. And it came through dialogue. This is a beautiful dialogue, right? Oh, it's, and it's so fun. Yeah. But, but what's with the old three great ones? <laughs> and they thought this was coincidental, of course, same day as Moses. So it was venerated and considered a very high scriptural reading. And Asclepius is the god of healing. Yeah. So it's a, supposed to be therapeutic or yes. in that mode of right. beneficial. Right. Right. What do you like reading? Uh, well, in one sense it's weird because I will try to play the character and at the same time understand it and understanding it. I that's, mean, that's didn't right. give up acting. I'd be like, okay, uh, after the first paragraph, I was like, okay, I'm just going with it. Like, it's, <laughs> uh, but it's beautiful because uh, it's such a fine synoptic vision of, of the uh, metaphysics. Yes. And yes, a nice introduction. Mixed in with like a little bit of actual like description of dialogue building the ideas. I mean. Yeah. And yeah. he wove together in a splendid way the logos, the self. Even Lucia. Yeah. And Hyparxis. And Hyparxis. Which is a really, that's going to the top. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's trying to run like a dialectic on it as much as possible. Oh. Like, yeah, the, um, someone mentioned Proclus too, right? Like he yeah. spent some time distinguishing this God as being the only good, only one worthy. I mean, he, we haven't seen that in any other writer, not any of the Neoplatonists or Plato, but um, it functions to uh, affirm the transcendency again of the first yes. principle. Quite, quite true, quite true. And uh, that conclusion, take a look at it again where we left off. Actually love to do that. And the good is inseparable from the God by being the God, divine self. What does that mean? Well, what page is that? Seven. Uh, seven. 
uh, number 16 in your text, about five lines, six lines down. Mm -hmm. For the good? Come on, see it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Go ahead, you read it? Go ahead. Oh, for the good is the most alien uh, to these, and the good is inseparable from Theos by being the God divine self. Slash divine self. Therefore, the divine self ends up being the good and God. Hold them all together in one sentence. Pretty clever. These people do some study. Yeah, 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 yeah. The earlier part of the work, there's an identification between divine luminosity and the highest goal. But as he goes further, he switches it and says, oh, no, 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 there's a cause for that divine light. And therefore, he gets out of the second hypothesis into the first. Oh, and then there's the rays of light. Yes. So that's the republic. Yeah. yeah. So, do you think this is a good place to come back the next time? Yes. You all know how to way to read it and study it? <laughs> Should we get them to read some more? What do you think? Yeah. Gentlemen? I'm for it, because it's uh, Hermes the rest of the A couple of more? <laughs> so what's that, seven and eight, or what? All right. Okay, go a couple of more. Sure. Well, okay. Are we in chapter four now? We're 17A. It's, oh, it's 17A. close to the end, by the way, so... Oh, okay, good. Then in turn, the other familiar name of the God is the Father, because he is the creator of all. For the Father is the one who creates... And for this reason, the begetting of children is the most serious and the most pious of concerns in life by those who are well mindful. For it is both a great misfortune and impiety for human beings to depart from life childless. Just as it is accursed by the sun to be sterile, barren, unproductive, justice is also imparted to such a one after death by spiritual beings. Thus the retribution is this, that the soul of the one who is childless is bound by law to enter into a body that has neither the nature of a man nor that of a woman. Therefore, Asclepius, never rejoice together with one that is childless, but instead pity their circumstance, knowing what kind of retribution awaits self. <laughs> <laughs> so much and such like have I taught thee, Asclepius, a certain foreknowledge of the nature of the all, of all. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you much. What do you think? So don't you think it, this is a good time to ask Juan and, Mur and uh, Marie what it was like translating this? Is that fair? What was it like translating? I remember when I first picked up this book, uh, I bought it at uh, one of Ross Wallbank's uh, one of Rod Wallbank's uh, Poseidon that he used to have in, at his house. And uh, I remember when I saw the book, uh, at the same time that I grabbed it, uh, Ken King grabbed it. <laughs> and I yanked it from his hand. <laughs> And then uh, just recently, my sister came up uh, with, uh, she, was, she bought a book for me and a, and a bunch of other people, uh, The Way of Hermes. Yes. And uh, she was really excited with it. And, which, and The Way of Hermes is a, is, is, is a small book. And it contains, yeah, that's it. And it contains, that book is actually a, just a portion of this one. And this one actually, 
is, is a four, uh, there's four books of this Hermetica, and uh, it, it has everything ever written about uh, the 18 books that are contained in, the, in this first volume. And uh, when I first read, a long time ago, when I first read this book, um, I didn't know what to think of it. I, I found it very strange. But since Pierre has been uh, enlightening us with, uh, with words like Luzia and the Logos and, and the Self, my mind has, like all of ours, I'm sure, has just continued to grow and understand better. And, and uh, so now this time that I went through it just recently, my wife and I, Maria and I, were, were just astonished at the beauty of it. Yeah. and the clarity of it yeah. and uh, I, I was no longer troubled by, by it as I was the first time but uh, I was really amazed and, and, uh, and we were in awe of it it's a very beautiful work um, and it, it um, one of the things that I thought was that I wish that um, that uh, Cosimo uh, Medici, who was a banker uh, in, 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 um, in Venice, was a uh, very rich man, a banker, uh, got uh, Ficino to translate uh, this book before he had him translate uh, Plato. And uh, to me, I thought, man, if only uh, Medici had had uh, Ficino translate Plato first, it would have made more sense to him <laughs> instead of having, trans having him translate this first because the, the foundation for this is, is in Plato. But uh, I wish that there would be more bankers like, like, like Cosimo. <laughs> Oh no no no, no the, the 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 to understand this book you gotta know the Platonic tradition otherwise it's not going to make sense. There's no part of it that speaks purely like there was a part about the transcendence of the cause. Mm -hmm. That that seems pretty clear. Well, yeah, but but it'll only make be real clear yeah. <laughs> if you have the Platonic tradition underneath it as a foundation, at least to me. Mm -hmm. But was Medici's purpose to get this out to the public? I believe so, because he, he wanted it uh, for his own self. I mean, he wanted, I think he wanted to depart, uh, before he departed this world, that he wanted to, to see what it had to say. Because it's kind of a quick uh, introduction to yeah, ideas. it is. It really is. Mm -hmm. uh, point the way. Mm -hmm. Do you yeah. think that he had reference to any other similar work, or was this uh, an entire revelation in terms of his view of God and other cultural values of the time? Oh, yeah. You know, I, I I wouldn't be able to say what other what other traditions it it, it touches because to me. Um, the only other tradition that it touches is when it talks about the deep, uh, about the deep, yes. and uh, and about the breath floating uh, or being upon the deep, which is from the Bible. Yeah, yeah I did have some physical reference. Also, the swimming. This guy jumps in at the deep end, doesn't he? Yeah. He does. Well, this was roughly at the same time they brought into Europe pseudo Dionysius. So that, that was enriching both of them. Mm -hmm. And that's a magnificent piece of so writing. So now, these, th this was introduced after Christianity? So, was well, it in well, heretical? Yeah, uh, you keep your date, see? Okay. Uh, Kashabandu, a French philosopher, examined the text and he said, it could not have been written at the time of Moses 
He did a linguistic analysis, but it must have been in the first century, and therefore that blew the idea that this work was contemporaneous with Moses. Right? Okay. But a lot of the church fathers, early church fathers of the Catholic Church, saw this work as an example of pure philosophy and theology. They bought into it, Saint, Saint, especially St. Augustine. But they never had the text. They just had the report that this is a great writing. So therefore, this came into Europe, in the, now in the 15th century, at the time the Medici's then got Pacino to translate it. Okay. So, Pierre, I'm just curious about this Hermes business. Like, why Hermes? And then on the other hand, it seems that we got this philosophical or mystical or spiritual tradition called the Hermetica. Right. But it's Neoplatonic philosophy. That's true. So is that... Yeah, this came out of Egypt or Alexandria. And that's where the Platonic tradition went. So that, that isn't answering your question. Ask it again. Well, why do you think... Hermes has been chosen here. Oh, why Hermes? Well, he's the, the agent of, he's the spiritual force between God, the ultimate God, and man. He's the messenger. He's, the, he's also, by the way, uh, in terms of Proclus' understanding of Greek gods, he's the, he is uh, the origin of philosophy. So he has three. He has Athena, uh, pardon me, not Athena, Aphrodite for love. Then he has Hermes and Apollo. And Apollo is said, therefore, to be the carrier of dialectic. So Hermes and Apollo are joined in the idea of the highest expression of philosophy and Greek thought. So, so this is before Yes. 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 Go ahead. And the one of the good being this combined is yes. the one of the Right. They're together. They're all saying the same thing. And when St. Augustine got his conversion, he didn't read Christian works, he read Plotinus. Mm. He cheated. <laughs> and when was that? When was St. Augustine's Pardon? conversion? When was that conversion of St. Augustine? Um, I can't tell offhand, but uh, he's in the fourth century. Oh, okay. What did he convert to? Pardon? Mm -hmm. What did he convert to? Christianity. Oh. Well, yeah. I thought that was the retractions. Yeah, but... Yeah, he had to give up his girlfriend. That was the thing that they demanded. By the way, St. Augustine's girlfriend was uh, two or three years younger than the minimum age for marriage in the Roman Empire. Yikes. What was the minimum age? Uh, how old might that be? Nine. <laughs> or nine. Yeah, way too young. <laughs> so he had to give up his girlfriend to become a priest. He did be no, mind the fact. Okay, mm -hmm. enough of those stories. <laughs> okay, thank you guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Oh, thank, you. Good. thank you. Thank you. That's still yeah. coffee. Right. Yeah. Ah, fun. Fun. It's a good piece of work, isn't it? Does anybody want more coffee? That's the or what we read today. Yeah. Yeah. Good. How you doing, huh? Thank you. My pleasure. You're a good man. That's what you are. Uh, hiya. Yeah. Yeah.
<laughs> he weighs a lot though. He's great. I got him. You want to hold him? Sure. Yeah. Two hands? She wants to hold him. Okay. Yeah. Got two hands? Oh yeah. Okay. There you are. There you are. Yeah, he's a great guy. Oh yeah. He's got amazing focus. Yeah. yeah.